So I've noticed something. There's been a huge spike in folks asking about the Yamaha FZ1 in the comments, in my inbox, in person. What do I think of it? What do I think of the one that they want to buy, my recommendations, etc. Now I've owned this bike for about a year and a half and we've had our ups and downs. So I know this bike very well. Previously, I had done a sort of five month off the cuff review. I admittedly never really saw the FZ1 as a bike that's really remarkable enough to get its own fully fleshed out review, you know? I mean, when you get right down to it, it's a Yamaha R1's more tame sister. I once made a famous analogy that super sports would bend you over like a dominatrix. But what if you're just not into that? Maybe you don't want strap, I mean, clip-ons. Maybe you want more entry-level BDSM, but still with room for yard surprise. Well, please, let me introduce you to the FCS 1000, otherwise known as the FC1. The first model year of the FC1 was 2001, but its DNA starts with the Yamaha R1, which actually had its first model year in 1998. Now the FC1 model that ran from 2001 to 2005 was actually the first generation. This video is more directly about the second gen because that's the one that I own myself. So here's a quick crash course on the first gen. For the FC1, Yamaha simply plucked the five valve four cylinder engine from the twin spar framed R1 and slapped it into a more old style tubular steel frame, albeit with a few more street friendly tweaks. They dropped the horsepower by about 10 ponies in favor of less peaky power output. You still get a respectable 125 horses at the wheel, but essentially you get it sooner. The suspension is the more standard style versus the R1's upside down forks and stiff race ready rear shock. The original FC1 was carbureted, but that's because the R1 at the time was also carbureted and the R1 received fuel injection for the 2002 model year. Now with that said, the first generation FC1 remained carbureted for its entire run until 2005 before receiving fuel injection in 2006 with the second gen. So 2006, that brings us to the main event, the second generation FC1, which ran all the way until the 2015 model year. This was a ground up completely different bike from the first gen. The most immediately apparent changes from the first gen are the design and the chassis. Now you get a modern aluminum twin spar frame, upside down forks, a fancy aluminum swing arm, familiar but redesigned bodywork and a fatter rear tire specification. But that's just the stuff that you see on the outside. The truth is, this bike is practically better in every single way from the first one. Let's start with the engine. You still have the 998cc 4-banger with that fancy 5-valve per cylinder setup, but since it's a few years and a few R1 generations away from the original, you instead get the since redesigned architecture from the 2004 to 2005 and arguably 2006 generation of the Yamaha R1. The basic difference between that one and the engine that ran from 1998 to 2003 is the change in bow and stroke and higher compression characteristics. From a track-ready corner carving missile to a well-mannered commuter or anything in between, and look awesome while doing it, the Yamaha FZ1 is a bike that's as versatile as anything on the road today. Its 998cc double overhead cam 20-valve engine is tuned for tremendous mid-range punch and massive top-end power. Fuel injection with computer-controlled sub-throttle valves provides precise fuel-air mix, while the narrow-angle 5-valve combustion chambers produce an intense 11.5 to 1 compression ratio. The 4 into 2 into 1 short style exhaust employs Yamaha's exclusive exhaust ultimate power valve, which automatically tunes exhaust flow, all for superb power delivery across the entire rev range. You will be excited by the power of this machine, as well as its handling. The 43mm inverted front fork is fully adjustable, and the single rear shock has adjustable preload and rebound damping, so you can set it up for a full on track day assault or a pleasant day of touring. As for ergonomics, a wide, comfortable seat, upright handlebars, and an integrated upper fairing cowl all mean you can ride all day in comfort and still find an aggressive position to set up for tight corners. The FZ1 also features a high-tech instrument display with analog tachometer, digital speedometer, and a trick fuel meter that lets you know how many miles you've gone on reserve. Sport touring, on the racetrack, or just riding around town, the FZ1 not only does it all, it does it all very well. When translated to the second gen FZ1, compression was still knocked back down, so honestly that means nothing for performance, but hey, you at least get to run regular gas in this thing no problem with the lower compression. It's the same engine overall and it's actually very similar frames between the bikes, which is why some accessories actually swap over between the FZ1 and the R1. The FZ1 setup of the same motor also includes a heavier crankshaft in the R1, less peaky cams in the R1, even taller gears, and a different balance shaft. Remember that inertial torque that gets sent out from the crank? We talked about that in the crossplane video. When a crank gets thrown around by the pistons, it actually creates its own sort of torque that makes it to the wheels alongside combustion torque. This all equals a more low down power band at the expense of the peak power of the R1. But how does this compare to the previous FC1? Well, as I mentioned, you get a modern 32-bit fuel injection system, 130 horses at the wheel, so five more than the original, 
320 millimeter rotors up front instead of 298. You lose damn near a gallon of fuel tank capacity, but that definitely contributes to the much lower weight rating of the second gen, weighing in at 485 pounds wet versus the original weight of 510 pounds. Now some people swear by the original FC1, and I guess it's similar enough that the ultimate question is, do you want carburation or fuel injection? Because really you can easily make the arrangements for a fork swap and a shock swap if you really want to update the suspension on the first gen. Granted, you can't get that nice updated bodywork in that blacked out frame and engine. And <laughs> let's be honest, you want that. Now you have two choices of body style with the FC1, but only in markets outside of the United States. Yeah, we Yanks only got the fared version, even though the world got both a naked and a fared version. So you may see a few different names being used when referring to the FC1. See, in the US, it's simply the FZ1, but it can also be referred to as the FZS1000, for example. That's what your uh, title document will say. In other markets like Europe, that same fared model that we got will be called the FZ1S Phaser, while the fully naked version will be called the FZ1N. Now, it's all the same bike. Yamaha just likes being difficult. Now, the bike that I bought, a 2006 Yamaha FZ1. If you're outside of the USA, add an S to the end of it. Solid bike, very beautiful Asian-like front fascia. No side fairings, but the head is so shapely that it doesn't look too top heavy without them. Tall drag bars, flat horizontal tail section. These shots were taken in a dealership right before I drove it off the lot. It was honestly interesting because it only had about 13,000 miles on it, which is nothing considering I picked it up in 2018 and it's 2006. As of this video, I'm at about 20,000 miles. That means that somebody drove it 13,000 in 12 years, which is like what, 1,000-ish miles per year? Now I put 7,000 on it in a year and a half. <laughs> oh, speaking of the previous owner, I have reason to believe that this bike was a one, maybe two owner vehicle before me because it actually came with service records and a pristine finish. This bike was probably the closest to a brand new bike I think I'll ever get. I mean, service records, still had the service manual and a tool bag, floppy OG lights, saddlebag mounts, Torin windshield, a tasteful slip-on, and the original 10 foot long fender in the back. I think an older gentleman owned this and it was probably his weekend toy to cruise around suburban New Jersey on a nice weekend. He probably kept it in his garage, but then I come along and reverse all of that. If you'd like to hear my first impressions on the bike, I did record them as soon as I left the dealer, so feel free to check them out in this video. Now, everything that I had read was true. It was a great bike. You get that sport bike feel with the inline four engine revving past 12,000 RPM. It's comfortable with that high bar and the lower and mid set foot pegs. In fact, on the ride home, I was so used to rear sets thanks to that track ready SV1000 that I was unknowingly resting my boot so far back on the slip on that it left like an ugly spot of burnt like shoe rubber on it. <laughs> what a great start, right? That reminds me, something, something was just missing here. See, that's the thing. Remember all the stuff that I mentioned earlier about how Yamaha made changes to the engine in order to get better low-end performance? I just wasn't seeing it. I would go so far as to call it limp at low RPM. I was on I was on the SV for a while, so the difference was very, very stark between them. I mean, you gotta really rev this thing out like any four-banging sport bike. Even with the crankshaft and the cams and the balancer, yada yada. No, you still gotta spin it up before the beans start coming out when you consider how long the gears are. I mean, you can hit damn near 90 in first if you really want to. I mean, the bike was developed to be emotional. More than anything, it seems like a poor Japanese translation, but still, the point gets across and it doesn't quite live up to it. Immediately, I came to the conclusion that I need to change the sprockets for this bike to get more acceleration heavy characteristics for my use case. You know what, screw it. Let's just continue getting the bad stuff out of the way while we're here. Right, so when it comes to the 2006 FC1, many people claim that there's like a throttle snatch issue, meaning when you go from the throttle being fully closed, that short period where you crack it open is very violent in their opinion, at like mid to high RPM. Now, it's worth mentioning because of just how many people complain about it, but personally, I, I never felt it. I don't feel it. I never really did feel it. 
When I get back on the throttle at 8K RPM, the bike pulls like I would expect a leader bike to pull. I really don't know what the problem is, but apparently it was fixed starting in 2007 or maybe 2008. Couldn't, couldn't really tell you. Now I will say that something interesting is definitely happening when I crack the throttle at mid to high RPM because I'll get this bang when the power comes back in. The snatchiness just comes from how the computer will cut the injectors like completely instead of partially with closed throttle but if this bang is like the byproduct of that then <laughs> coupled with the fact that i personally don't feel this complaint i'm the opposite and i kind of like it now still there's some things that really aren't up to preference you see this big ugly weld right here in the middle of the frame not only is that a visual eyesore, but some of the 2006 models and early 2007 models have a frame cracking issue where the frame will literally split right down the goddamn middle. But not like a catastrophic crack, like when you hit a bump, but you know, it'll get a little hairline fracture here and there. It'll just grow every time you ride it until one day the bike just ends up doing a shoulder lean. There's enough holding the bike together that it won't just split in half on the road, but that's a total bike right there. This manufacturing defect in the weld was addressed and the process was changed for the 2008 and up model years. And riders who experienced this issue with their 2006 and 7 bikes typically were covered for repairs, though I can't find any official info on a recall. It is estimated that 10% of all 06 and 07s out there are susceptible to this issue, so if you find yourself looking at a machine from these years, just inspect those welds on both sides of the bike, you know, especially if it's a low mileage machine. My bike has no cracks and if you look closely, you can kind of see this little panel it almost looks like a preemptive like patch and i'm not sure if if that's original or if it's the way they address the issue on frames that didn't crack yet i wouldn't be surprised if it's the latter because you know considering how thorough the previous owner with this bike was there's also these well-known charging system problems that can basically destroy your engine yeah essentially the rotor assemblies on the early second gen fc1s and even r1s at the time were poorly designed and the glue that holds in the magnets will they fail imagine little chunks of metal flying around getting stuck everywhere inside your engine <laughs> not great. They end up just grinding away things around them and pieces of magnets just go flying everywhere. Not only that, but the bearings of the generator can also just fail. Here's some information about that and a superseding part number that apparently addresses the issue. If you pick up an earlier model FZ1, it's definitely worth taking a look into preemptively. It was only really fixed starting with the uh, 2011 part. If you start hearing scary noises or your bike battery starts dying and not charging, take a look. Now we're still talking about the bad and this kind of solidifies something that I was thinking about. See, last year on Patreon, I had uploaded a story about how my FZ1 was wrecked. And the worst thing about it, it wasn't even wrecked by me. Now, since I'm exposing so much information about the bike, I'm just going to share it with all of you guys. I actually rebuilt this bike after it got effectively totaled. I will make a story video public and release it alongside this one. Link up here and also in the description. But without spoiling that story, if you want to watch me tell it, the wreck made me basically realize that the foot peg mountain location is honestly kind of poorly designed. See, the way it works is there's this tab welded onto the main body of the frame. The weld cracked right down the middle as the bike fell over and pushed the tab back, which makes the foot peg rear bolt rub the chain a little bit. For those of you great souls who actually watch my motor vlogs, you might remember the Soul of the Street Garage in my toy video. Well, they welded the tab back together. But at some point, I'll have to retweak it so it'll fully uh, clear the chain because I kind of had an oversight with that. Oh, that's actually why I had to cut that hill guard like that. Maybe you've noticed. So, for example, on the SV, the rear set's attached to the actual body of the frame, like it has an, a recessed portion of it. If you drop your FZ1, just realize that that tab might just bend right back if it drops hard enough. The silver lining? Well, <laughs> honestly, ever since I bought it, I always wanted to turn my bike into the FZ1N anyway. Yes, the FZ1N is definitely the superior looking version, if you ask me. And I might be a little bit biased, but as I mentioned, it was never sold in the USA. So if you want the naked style headlight, you have to either spend $600 on a genuine sourced Yamaha kit or $200 on a Chinese reproduction kit. Now I went Chinese and the result was fantastic. It comes with the headlight bracket, the housing, the headlight fairing things on the side, a mirror, maybe turn signals, and about half the hardware that you actually need and typically no instructions. But really the hardest thing of this job is tucking all the wiring. Remember, the front of your bike is shortened significantly, so you've got to reroute all that extra wiring or just shorten the wires, your pick. Throw some of the naked style radiator shrouds on the side and you have the front of the bike pretty much sorted out as the naked version. 
It's commonly referred to as the Euro conversion since we never got the naked one in the States. Now, the back of the bike is a little bit more tricky. The feared versions of the FZ1 have a single colored, uh, a single colored tail with like grab handles integrated into the plastic, while the naked version has the two-tone tail with the top being body colored and the lower part towards the rear being like a matte gray or like a natural plastic color. Now you could go all out and convert the tail to the naked style if you'd like, but you'll be replacing everything back there minus the subframe itself. And you gotta source all the parts from you know all around the world. The seat and the fairing bracket are actually different parts between the S and the N. I was actually in the process of doing it myself because I once had the ultimate goal to emulate that super hot one-off Abarth Aceto Corsa FZ1. I was super serious about it on a low key, but I kind of stopped in favor of the K100. But maybe I should get back on that. What do you think? So now I effectively have an FZ1N. I don't experience any snatchy throttle. The rotor hasn't imploded. The frame ain't cracked. I mean, I don't see those things happening really. Everything is good. But what about that lack of low-end power? I had to address that. So what I did was I went with a 1648 setup compared to the stock 1745 uh, sprocket setup. Basically, if you go down teeth on the sprocket in the front and go up in the back, you get more acceleration. And all you have to do is reverse that if you want more top speed. The original gearing, honestly, is really the bike's greatest shortcoming for me. And I found myself lugging it pretty often in heavy traffic. It's just too calm and too long for these quick blasts light to light that I experience here in New York. If you're on a highway often though, this gearing is gonna do wonders for your gas mileage as you put along in sixth gear. Now the 1648 setup definitely fixed the problem. And I went with uh, 1648 because it's the most drastic change for being able to use the same chain, like the stock chain. At the time, my chain had plenty of life left, so I just bought a cheap 48 tooth, you know, just threw it on it. But honestly, I can say that when I get a new chain soon, I'll more than likely also pick up a 50 tooth wrist rocket just to ramp it up even more. Now, when you change the gear and it throws off the speedometer a little bit. Now, mine reads slightly fast, but I have no problem with that because it keeps me traveling under the speed camera threshold a little bit more. So, for example, if I'm traveling 31, it'll say like 34. You know or 35. This bike has really tall gears in the transmission so it's gonna take you know these changes to kind of counteract that. Check out this gearing thread for a rough idea of you know where you want to take it. If you want to run a quiet 16 tooth sprocket up front you can actually source a rubber mounted front sprocket from the original FC1 and it'll swap right over. Fully metal aftermarket sprockets like the one I'm running make more noise but personally I really don't care enough about that. <laughs> maintenance? Well, it's the typical Japanese bike maintenance, which means it's awesome. I will say though, this bike eats rear tires for lunch, and that's probably a product of the gearing and the constant launches from light to light that I have to do. Tires, 120 up front, 190 out back. Adjustable suspension, brakes, twin four parts with big rotors, but the calipers are axial mounted, so some people tend to swap over an R1 front end for radio brakes. But unfortunately, the front end doesn't just bolt on like you think it would. So you have to do some work, you know, getting a stem that fits. Same uh, five spoke wheels as the R1. Dashboard is clear and concise with an analog tack. You know, this is my ideal setup. You don't get the lag of a digital tachometer, but you do get the easy readability of a digital speedometer. Gas gauge is standard, although it tends to read low when the bike is parked. You know, you gotta ride for a block or two to really see how much gas you actually have. Beautiful gas tank shape, by the way. Very muscular at the top, but the back and the bottom has an interesting flowy shape to it. The seat is nice and wide, and the under seat storage is easily accessed with the key. You can even remove the front seat with a little latch underneath it when you remove the rear seat. So there's no tools needed to get to the battery on this bike, you just need the key. The oil drain bolt is so fantastically placed because it clears the exhaust headers so when you dump it, it doesn't like drip all over the headers. The oil pan is also uh, removable, so if you unfortunately strip the threads out, you can just replace it. The rear shock is pretty easily accessed, and that center stand basically means that you could pop the rear tire off, or clean the chain, or even park the bike with a smaller footprint. It's honestly a great thing to have. It's a really solid bike, and I must recommend that gear and change if you think your daily rides are similar to mine. It definitely wakes the bike up, and the noise this thing makes. You know, it has this interesting quality where when you really rev it high up and you go full throttle, like the octave seems to drop for the intake noise, and it ends up sounding deeper the higher it goes when you pass 10,000 RPM. It's 
really angry and I want to get some arrow headers on this bike, you know, intake, tune. But honestly, this bike is so good as it is that I'm really dragging my feet with upgrading it. If you ever see me make this bike faster, then I'm officially just bored in general with life. It's plenty fast as is, but since it's a sport bike underneath, it'll happily accept a tune, quick shifter, exhaust, the works, you know. If you want to regain the 150 horsepower at the wheel and 170 at the crank of the stock 2004 R1, remember the FC1 is 130 at the wheel, 150 at the crank. Now, if you want to take it even further, I know some people who hop up FC1 engines by swapping in some R1 cams and all those things, you know, crank, everything like that, and then tuning those engines up for like 180 at the wheel. But at that point, too, just buy an R1 and give it dirt bars. The aftermarket support isn't super strong in the States, but you can import several exhaust systems and bodywork and, and all those modifications from a website called Webbike Japan. It's a super boutique website, but you know, who doesn't like JDM parts? Now, I've said it before, but I was actually supposed to buy a 2005 Speed Triple, but when I arrived at the dealer, it was already sold. Now, the dealer was all the way out in Jersey, so I wasn't leaving without putting a deposit down on something. So, I settled on the FC1. Now, this bike may have ultimately been a settlement, but I have, I have no regrets, definitely have no regrets. Hell, when it was wrecked, I could have just totaled it out and got a check from the insurance company. But I just put it back together and I kept it pushing. If you're looking for an FC1, I recommend the 2011 to 2015 model because by then they had sorted out all the throttle snatch and charging system issues. But honestly, you can settle for a 2008 and up without too much concern. Just, you know, check around if you're looking at a 2006 07 model. Now, with my short attention span, I won't say for certain how much longer I'll be keeping this bike, but it's worth mentioning that this is the longest I've ever owned a bike. Every bike before this, you know, had problems that made me ditch them. But for this one, I haven't found the reason yet. This one is truly a keeper. Thank you for watching. Now, I'm not sure what's really causing this spike in FZ1 interest, but hopefully this helped out anyone who's interested in getting one. Or entertain those of us who already have one. If you haven't yet, make sure you watch that crash story. It's a real doozy. Anyway, you just watch the illustrator, stay safe with all this stuff going on, and try your best to have a great week.